Tonight, the special edition of Charlie Rose. Uh, Mr. President, thank you very much for uh, this opportunity to talk to you at a very important moment because the President of the United States uh, will uh, address the nation uh, this week. Um, and as you know, important conversations are taking place in Washington and important things are happening here in your country. Do you expect an airstrike? Uh, as long as the United States doesn't obey the international law and trample over the charter of the United Nations, we have to worry that any administration, not only this one, would do anything. But uh, according to the lies that we've been hearing for the last two weeks from high-ranking officials in this administration, we have to expect uh, the worst. Are you prepared? Uh, we've been living in difficult circumstances for the last two years and a half, and we prepare ev uh, ourselves for every possibility. But that doesn't mean if you're prepared, th things would be better. It's going to get worse with any foolish strike or stupid war. What do you mean worse? Worse because of the repercussions, because nobody can tell what the repercussion of the first strike, or you're talking about one region, bigger region, it's not only about Syria, it's interlinked air region, it's intermingled, interlocked, whatever you want to, to call it. If you strike somewhere, you have to expect the repercussions somewhere else in different forms, in a way that you don't Are expect. you suggesting that if in fact there's a strike, there would be repercussions against the United States from your friends in other countries like Iran or Hezbollah or others? Yeah, as I said, it's, it, it may take different forms, direct and indirect. Direct when people want to retaliate or governments. Indirect when you're going to have instability and the spread of terrorism all over the region that will influence the West directly. Have you had conversations with Russia, with Iran, uh, with Hezbollah about how to retaliate? We don't discuss uh, uh, this issue uh, as a government, but we discuss the repercussions, which is more important because sometimes repercussions could be more destroying than the, stri the strike itself. Uh, any American strike will not destroy as much as the, uh, the terrorist has destroyed in Syria. So sometimes repercussions could be many doubles the strike itself. But some have suggested that it might tip the balance in the favor of the rebels uh, and lead to the overthrow of your government. Exactly. Any strike will be as direct support to Al-Qaeda of food that's called Al-Nasra, Jabhat Al-Nasra, mm -hmm. and the Islamic State of Iraq and Syria. You're right about this. It's going to be direct support. This is about chemical warfare, and let's talk about that. Do you approve of the use of chemical warfare? What do you mean? The no. use of chemicals, deadly no, chemicals? I do I think that we have to use also? Or no, do you think that it is an appropriate tool of war to use chemicals? The chemical? Yes. Uh, we are against any WMD, any weapons of mass destruction, whether chemical or nuclear. And so you're against the use of chemical warfare? Yeah, it's not only me. As a state, as a government, in 2001, we proposed to the United Nations a uh, proposal to uh, empty or to get rid of every WMD in the Middle East. And the United States stood against that proposal. So but this is our conviction and policy. But you're not a signatory to the uh, chemical warfare not yet. agreement. Not Why yet. not? Because Israel has WMD and it has to sign and Israel occupying our land. Mm -hmm. So that's why we talked about the Middle East, not Syria, not Israel. It should be comprehensive. Do you consider chemical warfare equivalent to nuclear warfare? I don't know. We haven't tried either. Yeah, but you know you're <laughs> a head of state and you understand the consequences well, of do weapons that don't discriminate. Te technically, that they're are not beyond. Yeah, technically they're not the same, but, but morally, it's the same. Morally, they're the same. They have the same, but at the end, killing is killing. And it's mass killing is mass killing. Yes. Sometimes you, you may kill tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands with very primitive uh, armaments. Then why do you have such a stockpile of chemical weapons? We don't discuss this issue in public because we never said that we have it. And we never said that we don't have it. It's a Syrian issue. It's a military, military issue, issue we never discussed in public with anyone. This is from the New York Times this morning. Mm -hmm. Syria's leaders amassed one of the world's largest stockpiles of chemical weapons with help from the Soviet Union and Iran, as well as Western European suppliers, and even a handful of American companies. According to American diplomatic cables, 
and declassified intelligence records, you have amassed one of the largest supplies of the chemical weapons mm. in the world. To have or not to have is a possibility, but to depend on what the media say is, not, is, is nonsense. Or to depend on some of the reports of the intelligence is nonsense, and that has proven when they invaded Iraq 10 years ago, and they said Iraq has stockpile of uh, WMD, and it was proven after the invasion that was false. It was fraud. So we cannot depend on what one magazine wrote. But at the end, I said it's not uh, something not to be discussed but with you, anyone. You accept that the world believes you do have chemical, a stockpile of chemical weapons. Who? The world. Uh, we the didn't United discuss States it. And, and other powers who also have chemical weapons. It's not about what they believe in. It's about what the reality that we have. And this reality, we own it. We don't have to discuss it. Speaking of reality, what was the reality on August 21st? Uh, what happened in your judgment? We were not in the area where the, alle where the, where the alleged chemical attack was happened. I said alleged. We're not sure that anything happened. Because even at this date, you are not sure that chemical weapons, even though you have seen the videotape, even though you've seen the bodies, even though no, uh, your own officials no, have I, been there. I haven't finished. Our soldiers in another area were attacked chemically. Our soldiers. They went to the hospital uh, as casualties because of chemical weapons. But in the area where they said the government used chemical weapons, we only had video and we only have pictures and allegations. We're not there. Our forces, our police, our institutions don't exist. How can you talk about what happened if you don't have evidences? We're not like the American administration. We're not social media administration or government. We are the government that deals with the reality. Well, when we have evidences, we will announce. Uh, well, as you know, Secretary uh, Kerry has said there is evidence that they saw rockets that fired from a, a region controlled by your forces into a region controlled by the rebels. Mm -hmm. uh, they have evidence from satellite photographs of that. Mm -hmm. uh, they have evidence of a, a, of a message that was intercepted about um, chemical weapons and, mm -hmm. and that soon thereafter there were other intercepted messages. So Secretary Kerry has presented what he concludes is conclusive evidence. No, he presented his confidence and he presented his convictions. It's not about, it's not about confidence, it's about evidence. The United, uh, sorry, the, the Russians have completely opposite evidence that the missiles were thrown from area where the rebels control. Uh, that reminds me uh, about what Kerry said uh, about the big lie that uh, Colin Powell said in front of the world on satellites about the WMD in Iraq before going to war. When he said, this is our evidence, uh, actually, uh, he gave uh, false evidence. In this case, Kerry didn't even present any evidence. He talked, we have evidence, and he didn't present anything. Not mm -hmm. yet, no, no, nothing so far. Well, the United not, not, not single shred of evidence. Mm -hmm. yeah. Do you have some remorse for those bodies, those people, it is said to be up to at least 1,000 or perhaps 1,400 who were in eastern Ghouta who died. We feel pain for every Syrian victim. But what about victims of this assault from chemical warfare? Dead is dead. Killing is killing. Crime is crime. It's when you feel pain, you feel pain about their family, about the, about the losses that you have in your country. Whether one person killed or 100 or 1,000, it's a loss. It's a crime. It's a moral issue. We have family that we sit with, uh, family that they love their dear ones. It's not about how they kill. It's about they, they are dead now. This is the bad thing. Uh, Has there been any remorse or sadness on well, behalf of the Syrian people the, for what happened? I think sadness prevails in Syria now. We don't feel anything else but sadness because we have this killing every day, whether chemical or whether with, the, with any kind. It's not about how. We, we feel with it every day. But, but this was indiscriminate and children were killed and, and people who said goodbye to their children in the morning didn't see them and will never see them again. You mean uh, which, uh, which? In, in Ghouta. In Ghouta? Yes. That's the case every day in Syria. That's why we have to stop the killing. That's why we have to stop the killing. But what indiscriminate you're talking about? You said well, the fact that chemical warfare is indiscriminate in who it kills. Do you have evidence that we, there was Innocents as well as combatants. Yeah, but you're not talking about evidence now, you're not talking about facts, we're talking about allegation. So we, we're not sure that if there's chemical weapon used and who used it. We cannot talk about virtual thing. 
We have to talk about facts. It is said that your government uh, delayed the United Nations observers from getting to Ghouta, and that you denied and, and delayed the Red Cross and the Red Crescent hmm. from getting there to make observations and to help. The opposite happened. Your government delayed because we asked for delegation in March 2012 when the first attack happened in Aleppo in the north of Syria and they delayed it till just a few days before Al Ghouta when they sent the, those uh, uh, team. And the team itself said in his letter, in his report, that he did everything as he wanted. There was not a single obstacle. But they have said they were delayed in getting there. They wanted to be there earlier. No, no, no. There, were, there was a conflict. There was fighting. There was uh, shooting. That's it. We didn't uh, prevent them from going anywhere. We, we, we asked them to come. Why to, why to delay them? Even if, if you want to take the, st the American story, they say we, uh, we used the chemical weapons the same day uh, the team uh, or the investigation team came to Syria. Is it logical? It's not logical. Even if, he, if a country or army wanted to use such uh, uh, weapons, he should have waited a few days till the investigation finished its work. It's not logical. The whole story doesn't even hold together. We'll come back to it. Um, if, you, if your government did not do it, despite the evidence, who did it? We have to be there to get evidences, like what happened in Aleppo when we have the evidences. And because the United States didn't send the team, we then send the evidences to the Russians. But don't this you want to know the answer if you don't accept the evidence so far as to who did this? The question, who threw chemical missiles the same day on our soldiers? That, uh, the same question. Definitely not the soldiers. Soldiers doesn't throw missiles on themselves. Mm -hmm. So either the rebels, the terrorists, or third party. We don't have any clue yet. We have to be there to collect the evidence, then we can give answer. Well, the argument is made that the rebels don't have their capability of using chemical weapons. They do not have the rockets and they do not have the supply of chemical weapons that you have, so therefore they could not have done it. No, first of all, they have rockets and they've been throwing rockets on Damascus for a month. That carry chemical weapons? Rockets, right. rockets in general. They have the, the means first. Second, the sarin gas that they've been talking about for the last two weeks is very primitive gas. You can have it the done. sarin gas. Sarin gas. You can have it done in the backyard of a house. It's very primitive gas. So it's not something complicated. But this was not primitive. This, is second. this was a terrible use Th of chemical weapons. Third, they've been, they used it in Aleppo in the northern of Syria. Fourth, there's video on YouTube where the terrorists clearly make trial on a rabbit and kill the rabbit and said, this is how we're going to kill the Syrian people. Fifth, there's a new video about one of, the, of those women who uh, they consider as a rebel or fighter or whatever, work with those terrorists. And they say, she said, they didn't tell us how to use and that, that to use the chemical uh, weapons. And one of those weapons exploded in one of the tunnels and killed the 12. That's what she said. Those are the evidences that we have. Anyway, the party who accused He's the one who has to bring evidences. The United States accused Syria, and because they accused, you have to bring evidence. This first of all. We have to find evidences when we are there what as government. What evidence would be sufficient for you? What evidence? Uh, would be sufficient. What evidence for would example, prove the case for, for example, you? in Aleppo, we, we had the, the missile itself and the material and the sample from the, uh, from the uh, sand, from the soil and a uh, sample from the blood. But the, the argument is made that you bombarded, your forces bombarded Ghouta soon thereafter with the intent of covering up evidence. Okay, let, uh, how could bombardment cover the evidence? The, technically, it doesn't work. How? This is stupid, to be frank. This is very stupid. But you acknowledge the bombardment? Of course, we, there was fight. We, we, we can, we, that's, uh, that happened every day. Now you can have it. But let's talk, they ha have indications. Let me just finish this point, because how can you use WMD while your good troops only 100 meters away from it? Is it logical? It doesn't happen. It cannot be used like this. Anyone who's not military knows uh, this fact. Why do you use chemical weapons while you're advancing? Last year was much more difficult than this year, and we didn't use it. Yeah. Uh, there is this question, too. If it was not you, mm -hmm. Uh, 
does that mean that you don't have control of your own chemical weapons and that perhaps they are falling into the hands of other people who might want to use them? That implies that we have chemical weapons first. Yes. That implies that it's being used second. So we cannot answer this question until we answer the first part and the second part. Third, let's presume that a country or army have these weapons. These kind of armaments cannot be used by infantry, for example, or by anyone. This kind of armament should be used by specialized units. So it cannot be in the hand of anyone. Well, exactly, and that's which, the point that... Which is controlled centrally. Ah, so you were saying that if, in fact, your government did it, you would know about it and would have approved it. I'm talking about general case. Okay, Everywhere but generally in you're the saying world. if, in fact, it happened, I would have known about it and approved it. In generally, that's the in, no nature in, of centralized in every power. In every country, yes. And we are part of every country. I'm talking about the general rules, because I cannot discuss with this point with you in details unless I'm telling you what we have and what we don't have. Something I'm not going to discuss, as I said at the very beginning, because this is a military issue that do, could not be. Do discussed. you question the New York Times article I read to you, what saying you that you had a stockpile of chemical weapons? You're not denying that. No, no, we don't say yes, we don't say no, because as, as long as it's classified, it shouldn't be discussed whether yes or not. The United States is prepared to launch a strike against your country because they believe chemical weapons are so abhorrent that anybody who uses them crosses a red line, and that therefore, if they do that, they have to be taught a lesson so that they will not do it again. Hmm. What red line? a red line of the use of chemical weapons against your who, own people. Who drew it? Who uh, well, the president says it was not just him, that the world has drawn it mm -hmm. in their revulsion against the use of chemical weapons, that no, the no. world has yeah. drawn that no, red it's line. It's not the world, because uh, Obama drew that line, and Obama can draw a line for himself and for his country, not for other countries. We have our red lines, like our sovereignty and our independence. While if you want to talk the word uh, red lines, United States used uranium, depleted uranium in Iraq. Israel used white phosphorus in Gaza. And nobody said anything. What about the red lines? We don't see red lines. It's political red lines. The president is prepared to strike, uh, and perhaps we'll get the authorization of Congress or not. Uh, the question then is, would you give up chemical weapons if it would prevent the president from authorizing a strike? Uh, if that is a deal you would accept. Again, you always imply that we have chemical weapons. I have to, because that's the <laughs> assumption of the president. Yeah. That is his assumption, and he yeah. is the one who will order the strike. It's his problem if, if he has an assumption. But for us in Syria, we have principle. We do anything to prevent the region from another crazy war. It's not only Syria, because it will start in Syria. You do anything to prevent the region the from region. having another crazy war. Yes. You recognize the consequences for you if there is a strike. It's not about me. It's about the region. Well, it's it's about, about your country. It's yeah, about your people. Of course, of course. My country and me, we are part of this region. We're not, we're not separated. You cannot discuss it as Syria or as me. It should be as part, as a whole, as comprehensive. That's so how we have to look at it. Some ask, why would you do it? It's a stupid thing to do if you're going to bring a strike down on your head by using chemical weapons. Others say you do it because, A, you're desperate, or in the alternative, you do it because you want other people to fear you. Yeah. Because these are such fearful weapons that if the world knows you have them, and specifically your opponents in Syria, the rebels, mm. then you have gotten away with it and they will live in fear. And that yeah. therefore the president has to do something. You cannot be desperate when the army is making advancement. That should have happened if, and I said, if, if we take into consideration that uh, this presumption is correct and this is reality. You use it when you're in desperate, desperate uh, situation. Our position is much better than before, so it's not correct. You think you're winning the war? I don't know what to add. Is, uh, winning is a subjective uh, word, but we are making advancement. This is the correct word, because yeah. winning for some people is when you finish completely. When you win completely. And the argument is made that if you're winning, it is because of the recent uh, help you've gotten from Iran and from Hezbollah. And, and additional supplies that have come to your side. People from outside of Syria supporting you in the effort against the rebels. Iran doesn't have any soldier in Syria. So how could Iran help me? Supplies, weaponry. That's all before the crisis. We always have this kind of uh, cooperation. Hezbollah, Hezbollah fighters have been here. 
Hezbollah fighters on the from border outside with, of the country. Only on the border with Lebanon, where the uh, terrorists attacked them. On the border with, uh, with Lebanon, this is where Hezbollah retaliated, and this is where we have cooperation, and that's good. Hezbollah forces are in Syria today. On the border area with Lebanon, where they want to protect themselves and cooperate with us. But they don't exist all over Syria. They cannot exist all over Syria anyway, for, 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 for many reasons. But they exist on the borders. What advice are you getting from the Russians? About? About this war, about how to end this war? Every friend of Syria looking, is looking for peaceful solution. And we are convinced about that. We have this advice, and without this advice, we are convinced about it. Do we you have, have a plan to end the war? Of course. Which is? At the very beginning, it was uh, fully political. When you had these terrorists, the first part of the same plan, which is political, should start with the stopping the smuggling of terrorists coming from abroad, stopping the logistic support, the money, the, all the of, all kind of supports coming to these uh, terrorists. This is the first part. Second, you can have national dialogue where uh, different Syrian parties sit and discuss the future of Syria. Third, you, can, you will have the uh, interim government or transitional government. So you would meet the, with then, rebels? Then, then you'll have the final uh, elections, parliamentary, parliamentary elections, and you're going to have the presidential election. But the question is, would you meet with rebels today to discuss a negotiated settlement? In the initiative that we issued at the beginning of this year, we said every party with no exceptions. So you as, long, with as long as they give up their armaments. But you'll meet with the rebels and anybody who is fighting against you we don't if they have, give up their weapons. Yeah, we don't, don't have problem at all. But then they will say, you're not giving up your weapons. Why should we give up our weapons? Does the government give up, give, give, give up its weapons? Have you heard about that before? No, but the, rebels don't the, normally the, give up their the, weapons either during the negotiation. The, they do that after a the, successful... The, the armament uh, of the government is legal armament. Any other armament is not legal. So how can you compare? Mm -hmm. It's completely different. There is an intense discussion going on about all the things we're talking about yeah. in Washington, where if there's a strike, it will emanate from the United States' decision to do this. What do you want to say in this very important week in America mm -hmm. and in Washington to the American people, mm -hmm. to members of Congress, uh, to the President of the United States? Uh, I think the most important Part of this now is, uh, let's say, the American people. But the, the polls show that mo the majority now don't uh, want to war anywhere, not only against Syria. But uh, the Congress is going to vote uh, about this in a few days. And I think the Congress is elected by the people and represent the people and work for their interests. The first question that they should ask themselves, what do wars give America since Vietnam till now? Nothing. No political gain, no economic gain, no good reputation. The United States is at all low time. The credibility is at all low, all time low. Uh, the, so this war is against the interest of the United States. Why? First of all, because this is the war that is going to support Al Qaeda and the same people that uh, kill Americans in the 11th uh, of September. The second thing that we all want to tell to, to the Congress that they should ask, and that's what we expect. We expect them to ask this administration about the evidence that they have regarding the chemical story and allegations that they presented. I wouldn't tell the, uh, the president or any other official because we were disappointed by their behavior recently because we expected this administration different from Bush's uh, administration. They are adopting the same uh, doctrine with different accessories. That's it. So we expect, if we want to expect something from, the, from this administration, is not to be weak, to be strong, to say that we don't have evidence, that we have to obey uh, the international law, that we have to go back to the Security Council and the United Nations. Question remains, what can you say to the president who believes chemical weapons were used and were used by your government Mm. that this will not happen again. I will tell you very simply, present what you have as evidence to the, to the public. Be transparent. When and you, if he does? If he does. If he presents that evidence? This is where you can discuss the evidence that he doesn't have. 
He didn't present it because he doesn't have, Kerry doesn't have, no one in your administration have. If they had it, they would have presented it to you no. as media for the, they for have, the first they, day. They have presented it to the Congress. Nothing. They Nothing have shown was the Congress what they have and the evidence they have from satellites, intercepted messages, and the like. Nothing presented. And Nothing has been presented so far. They have presented to the Congress, sir. You're, you're a reporter. Get, get the, uh, this uh, uh, evidence well, and show it to the, to the public in your country. They're presenting, we, it we to the, they're presenting it to the public representative. You don't show your evidence and what you're doing and your plans to, to other people that within your own council. They're so, showing it to the people's representative so you uh, who to, have to vote. Yeah on an authorization to strike, and if they don't find the evidence sufficient. First of all, we have the president, president of uh, Colin Powell 10 years ago. When he showed the evidence, it was false and it was forged. This is first. Second, you want me to believe American evidence and don't believe the indication that we have. We live here. This is our reality. Your indications are that what? Sorry? What, what your indications are that it was? That the... the rebels or the terrorists used the chemical weapons in northern of Aleppo five months ago. And, and on August 21st? No, no, no. That was before. That was in March. On the 21st, again, they used it against our soldiers in our area where we control it. And our soldiers went to the hospital and you can mm. see them if you want. But the area where that attack took place was controlled by rebel forces. The, uh, that you're talking about, about the chemical attack? Yes. Yeah, what if they have stockpiles and they exploded because of the bombardment. What if they used the missile by coincidence and attacked themselves mm -hmm. by, by, by mistake? Let me talk or by coincidence, by mistake. Yes. Mm -hmm. Let me move to the question of whether a strike happens, and I touched on this before. Mm -hmm. uh, you have had fair warning. Have you prepared by moving possible targets? Are you moving um, targets within civilian populations, all the things that you might have done if you have time to do that, and you have had clear warning that this might be coming. Syria is in state of war since uh, its land was occupied for more than uh, four uh, decades. Uh, and the nature of the frontier in Syria implies that most of the army is in inhabited area. Most of the centers are in inhabited area. You hardly find any military uh, base in a uh, distant uh, area from the cities, unless uh, it's an uh, airport or something like this. But most of the military bases or centers uh, are within inhibited area. Will there be attacks against American bases in the Middle East if there is an airstrike? You should expect everything. You should expect everything. Not, not necessarily through the government. It's not only, the governments are not only, not the only player in this region. You have different parties, you have different factions, you have different ideology, uh, you have everything in this region now. So uh, you have to expect that. Expect, tell me what you mean by expect everything. Expect every action. Including everything. chemical warfare? That depends if the, uh, if the rebels or the uh, terrorists in this region or any other group have it, could happen, I don't know. We don't, I'm not a fortune, fortune teller to tell you what's going to happen. But we'd like to know more, and I think the President would like to know, American people would like to know, you yeah. know, if there's an attack, you know, what might be the repercussions and who might be engaged in those repercussions? Before the 11th of September, in my discussion with many officials in the United States, some of them are congressmen, I used to, to say that don't deal with the terrorists in, uh, as uh, playing games. It's a different story. You're going to pay the price if you're not wise in dealing with the terrorists. So nobody expects, we said there are going to be a repercussion of the uh, mistaken way of dealing with it, of treating the terrorism. But nobody expected 11th of September. So you cannot expect, it's difficult for anyone to tell you what is going to happen. It's, it's an area where everything is on the brink of explosion. You have to expect everything. Let's talk about the war today. A hundred thousand people dead, a million refugees, um, a country being destroyed. Do you take some responsibility for that? That depends on the decision that I took. From the first day I took the decision as president to defend my country. 
So uh, who killed? That's another question. Actually, the terrorists have been killing our people since the beginning of this crisis two years ago, two years and a half. And uh, the Syrian people wanted the government and the state institutions and the army and the poli police to defend them. And that's what happened. So talking about the responsibility, I took the, my responsibility according to the Syrian constitution that said we have to defend ourselves. Uh, Mr. President, you, you constantly say it's terrorist. Mm. Most people look at the rebels and they say that Al-Qaeda and other forces from outside Syria are no more than 15 or 20 percent of the forces on the ground. Mm -hmm. The other 80 percent are Syrians, are defectors from your government, and defectors from your military. They are people who are Syrians mm -hmm. who believe that their country should not be run by a dictator, should not be run by one family, mm -hmm. and that they want a different government in their country. That's 80 percent of yeah. the people fighting against you, not we terrorists. No, we didn't say uh, 80 percent, for example, or the majority or the vast majority are foreigners. We said the majority, the vast majority are Al-Qaeda or Al-Qaeda of shoots uh, organizations in this region. When you talk about Al-Qaeda, it doesn't matter if he's Syrian or American or from Europe or from Asia or Africa. Al-Qaeda have one ideology and they go back to the same leadership in Afghanistan or in Syria or in Iraq. That's the question. We, you have uh, tens of thousands of foreigners, that's definitely correct. We are fighting them on the ground and we know, we know this. But that's 15 or 20 percent of this. You, nobody, nobody has real... Uh, but that's a realistic uh, look at how many? 20 or... 15 or 20 percent. No, no, I've said... Fighters nobody, from outside. Nobody knows because when they are dead and when they are killed, they don't have any ID. You look at their faces, they look foreigners, but where are they coming from? How precise this estimate is difficult to tell. But definitely the majority are Al-Qaeda. This is what concerns us, not the, ma not the nationality. If you have Syrian Al-Qaeda or Pakistani Al-Qaeda or Saudi Al-Qaeda, what's the difference? What's the matter? The, the most important thing is that the, the majority are Al-Qaeda. We never said that the majority are not Syrians. But we said the, ma the minority are what they called free, free Syrian army. That's what we said. Do you believe this is becoming a religious war? It started partly as a sectarian war so, some, in some areas, but now it's not. Because if you talk about sectarian war or religious war, you should have very clear line between the sects and religions in Syria uh, according to the geography and the demography in Syria, something we don't have. So it's not religious war, but Al-Qaeda always use the uh, religions, the Islam actually, as pretext and as a cover and as a mantle for their war and for their terrorism and for their killing and beheading and so on. Why has this war lasted two and a half years? Because of the external interference, because there's an external agenda uh, supported by, or let's say led by, the United States, the West, the petrodollar countries, mainly Saudi Arabia, and before was Qatar, and Turkey. That's why it lasted two years and a half. But, but what are they doing, those countries you cited? Yeah, they have different agendas. For the West, they wanted to undermine the Syrian positions. For the petrodollar countries like Saudi Arabia, the thing undermining Syria will undermine Ira, Ira, Iran on a sectarian basis. Uh, for Turkey, uh, they think that if the Muslim Brotherhood take over the rest of the region, uh, they will be uh, very comfortable, they will be very happy, they will uh, make sure that the, uh, polit their political future is guaranteed. So they have different agendas and different goals. But at the same time, as I said, you've used Hezbollah and you've gotten support from Iran, from Russia. So what's happening here? Is this a, a kind of, uh, of war that uh, exists because of support from outside Syria on both sides? This cooperation, 
I don't know what do you mean by support. We have cooperation with those countries for, 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 for decades. Why to talk about this cooperation well, now? But then you tell me, what are you receiving from Iran? Political support. That's it? And no weapons, every agreement, no weapons, every no agreement, support, every support, no. No, no, no. There's, there, we have agreements with many countries, including Iran, including Russia, including other countries, that uh, it's about uh, different things, including armaments. It's cooperation, like any, uh, like like any cooperation between uh, the any two countries, which is uh, normal. It's not related to the crisis. You don't call it support. You call it because you pay, you pay money for what you get. So you don't call it support. It's a uh, cooperation. Uh, call it whatever you want. But to, to the word support is not precise. We ha uh, from Russia, for example, we have political support, which is different from the cooperation. We have cooperation for 60 years now, but now we have political support, which is... Well, but the Russians have said they have ongoing support for you b beyond just political cooperation. I mean, mm. they have treaties that existed with Syria. Exactly. And they, and they provided all kinds of uh, defensive weapons. Yeah, you said the treaties, and you said... Uh, uh, and the, the official, uh, the Russian official said, we have uh, not agreements, contracts that we have to fulfill. And those contracts, like any country, you buy armaments, you buy anything you want. But, but do you believe this has become a conflict of Sunni versus Shia? No, not yet. It's in the mind of the Saudis, in the mind of the Wahhabis. In the minds of the Iranians? No, no. They actually, what they are doing is uh, the opposite. They try to open channels with the Saudi, with, the, with many other Islamic uh, entities in, the, in this region in order to, to talk about Islamic society, not Sunni and Shia societies. Was there a moment yeah. for you yeah. as you saw the Arab Spring approaching Syria yeah. Yeah. that you said, I've seen what happened in Libya. Mm -hmm. I've seen what happened in Tunisia. Mm. I've seen what happened in Egypt. Yeah. It's not going to happen to Bashar al-Assad. Mm -hmm. I will fight anybody who tries to overthrow my regime with everything I have. No, for one reason, because uh, the first question that I ask, do I have public support or not? That's the first question that I ask as president. If I don't have the public support, whether there's Arab, what's the so-called Arab Spring, it's not Spring any, any way, but whether we have this or we don't, if you don't have public support, you have to quit, you have to leave. If you have public support in any circumstances, you have to stay. That's your mission, you have to help the people, you have to, to, to serve the people. Uh, so, uh, uh, I never said, yeah, sorry. No, go ahead. Yeah. When you say public support, people will point to uh, Syria and they say a minority sect, Alawites, mm -hmm. control a majority Sunni population and it's a dictatorship uh, and they do it because of force of their own instruments of power. That's how, that's what you have. Mm -hmm. Not public support yeah. for this war yeah. against now it's been other Syrians. Yeah. Now you've been, it's been two years and a half, okay? Two years and a half, and Syria is still withstanding against the United States, the West, Saudi Arabia, the richest country in, the, in, in this area, including Turkey. And taking into consideration what your question implies, that even the big part or the bigger part of the Syrian population against me, how can I withstand till today? I'm either uh, superhuman or superman, which is not the case. Or you have a powerful army. The army made of the people. It cannot be made of robots. It's made of people. Surely you're the not suggesting that this army is not uh, at your will and the will of your family. How can you, uh, what, do, what do you mean by the will of the family? The yeah. will of your family. If, 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 if at your the brother is in the military. Uh, the military has been at, I mean, every observer of Syria believes that this is a country controlled by your family and controlled yeah. by the Alawites who are your allies. Yeah. That's the control. If that situation is correct, what you're mentioning, we wouldn't have withstand 40 years and a half. We would have disintegration of the army. 
this integration of the whole institution in the uh, states would have this integration of Syria, if that's the case. It cannot be tolerated in Syria. Well, I'm talking about the normal reaction of the people. If it's not national army, it cannot have the support, and if it doesn't have the public support of every sect, it cannot do its job in advance recently. It cannot, it cannot be the, the, the army or the family doesn't make national war. Some will argue that you didn't have the support because, in fact, the rebels were winning before you got the support of Hezbollah uh, and, and in large support from the Iranians, that you were losing. And then they came in and gave you support so that you were able to at least start winning and produce at least a stalemate. No, the context is wrong because talking about winning and losing is like if you're talking about two armies fighting on two territory, which is not correct, it's not the case. Those are gangs coming from abroad, infiltrated, inhibited area, kill the people, take their houses, and shoot at the army. The army cannot do the same. Yeah. And the army doesn't but, exist but everywhere. they control a large part of your country. No, they took every part, they went to every part where there's no army in it. And the army go to, to clean, to get rid of them. They don't go and attack the army in an area where the army occupied that area and took it from it. It's completely different. It's not, it's not correct or it's not precise what you're talking about. So it's completely different. The army, what, what the army is doing is to clean those areas and the indication that the army is strong that is making advancement in that area. He never went to one area and couldn't enter to it. That's the indication. How could that army do that if he's a family army or a sect army? What about the rest of the country? who support uh, the government. It, it, it's not realistic. It doesn't happen. Otherwise, the whole country will collapse. One small point about American involvement here. Um, the president has gotten significant criticism uh, because he has not supported the rebels more. As you know, there was an argument within his own councils from Secretary of State Clinton, mm -hmm. from CIA Director David Petraeus, from the Defense Department, Leon Panetta, the Secretary of Defense, uh, and others that they should have helped the rebels two years ago and we would be in a very different place. So the president uh, has not given enough support to the rebels in the view of many people. And there's criticism that when he made a recent decision to give support, uh, it has not gotten to the rebels hmm. because they worry about the composition. If the American administration wanted to support Al-Qaeda, go ahead. That's what they ha we have to tell them. Go ahead and support Al-Qaeda. But don't talk about rebels and Free Syrian Army and so on. The majority of fighters now are Al-Qaeda. If you want to support them, you are supporting Al-Qaeda. You are creating heaven in the region. And if this region is not stable, the whole world cannot be stable. With respect, sir, most people don't believe the majority of the forces are Al-Qaeda. Yes, there is uh, a number of people who are Al-Qaeda affiliates and, and who are here who subscribe to the principles of Al-Qaeda. Uh, but that's not the majority of the forces, yeah. as you know. I mean, you know that the composition differs within the regions of Syria as to the forces that are fighting against your regime. The American officers should learn to deal with reality. Why did the United States fail in most of its wars? Because it always based its war on the wrong information. So whether they believe or not, this is not reality. I have to be very clear and very honest. I'm not asking them to, to believe if they, if they don't want to believe. This is the reality. I'm telling you the reality from our country. We live here. We know what's happening. And they have to listen to people who live here. They cannot listen to their, only to their media or to their research centers. They don't live here. No one lives here but us. So this is the reality. If they, if they want to believe, that's good. That will help them understanding the region and being more successful in their mm. policies. Many people think this is not a sustainable position here, that this war uh, in, cannot continue because the cost for Syria is too high. Too many deaths, 100,000 and counting, uh, too many refugees, mm -hmm. too much destruction. Yeah. The soul and of a country mm -hmm. at risk. If it was for the good of the country, would you step down? That depends on the relation between me staying in this position and the conflict. You cannot discuss it just to say you have to step down. To step down, why? And what the expected result? This is first. Second, uh, when you're in the middle of a storm, leaving your country just because you have to leave without any 
a reasonable uh, reason, uh, it means you're getting you're quitting your country, and this is treason. So uh, it would be you're saying it would be treason for you to step down right now because of your obligation unless, to the country. Unless the public wants you to quit. And how will you determine that? By the two years and a half withstanding, without the public support, we cannot, we cannot withstand two years and a half. Look at the other country, look what that happened in Libya and Tunisia and Egypt. Do you worry about that? What happened to Gaddafi? What happened to... No, we are worrying that the rebels are taking control in many countries. And look at the results now. Are you satisfied as American? What are the results? Nothing. Very bad. Nothing good. There was a report recently that, that you had talked about, or someone representing you had talked about some kind of deal in which you and your family would leave the country if you were guaranteed safe passage, uh, if you were guaranteed there would be no criminal prosecution. Mm -hmm. You're aware of these reports. Yeah. We have this guarantee from the first day of the crisis. <laughs> because of the way you've acted. No, because the agenda that I talked about, some of these agendas wanted me to quit, very simply. So they said, we have all the guarantees if you want to leave, and all the money and everything you want. <laughs> of course, uh, you just uh, ignore that. It's so you've been offered that opportunity. Yeah, but it's not about me again. It's, I'm not fi it's, it's not my fight. It's not the fight of the government. It's the fight of the country, of the Syrian people. That's how we look at it. It's not about me. It's, it's not about, about you. It's, not, it's about every Syrian. What in the end, what's the end uh, game? Okay, of, of, uh, of this war? Yes. It's very simple. When the Western countries stop, stop supporting those terrorists and making pressure on their puppets country and client, client states like Saudi Arabia and Turkey and others, you will have, have no problem in Syria. It will be solved easily because the, those fighters, the Syrian part that you're talking about, lost its natural incubators in the Syrian society. They don't have incubator anymore. That's why they have incubator abroad. They need money from abroad. They need the moral support and political support from abroad because they don't have any grassroots, any, any, any incubator. So when you stop this smuggling, we don't have problems. Yeah, but at the same time, as I've said before, you have support from abroad. There are those who say you would not be able to survive without the support of Russia and Iran. No, it's not me. I don't have support. Uh, your Although government would not be able to support. Not me. All Syria. Survive. Every agreement is between every class and every sector in Syria. Government, people, um, trade, uh, military, uh, culture, everything. It's like the cooperation between your country and any other country in the world. It's the same cooperation. It's not about me. It's not support for the I, crisis. I mean about your government. Yeah. You say that the rebels only survive because they have support from Saudi Arabia and Turkey and yeah. the United States and Qatar, no, perhaps. the difference. And I'm saying that no, they no, no. say you only survive no. because uh, no. you have the support of Russia uh, yeah. and Iran no. and Hezbollah. Ne the external support can never substitute internal support, can never, for sure. And the, the example that you have to, to look at uh, very well, um, Egypt and uh, Tunisia, they have all the support from the West and from the Gulf and, and, and from the most of the countries in the world, when they don't have support within their country, they couldn't continue more than how many weeks? Three weeks. So the only reason we stand here for two years and a half because we have internal support, public support. So any external support, if you want to call it support, let's use this word, it's going to be additional, but it's not based to depend on more than the Syrian support. You and I have talked about this before. And we remember Hama and your father, Hafez al-Assad. Uh, he ruthlessly set out to eliminate the Muslim Brotherhood. Are you simply being your father's son here? I don't know what you mean by ruthlessly. Because you know uh, what happened at Hama? I've never heard the war, a soft war. Have you heard about soft war? There's no soft war. War is a war. Any war is ruthless, and when you fight terrorists, 
you fight them like any other war. So the lessons you have here are the lessons you've learned from your father and what he did in Hama, and which it is said in, and influenced you greatly. It said what? Sorry. It is said that what your father did yeah. at Hama mm -hmm. influenced you greatly mm. in terms of your understanding of yeah. what you have to do. The question, what would you do as an American if the terrorists invading your country from different areas and started killing tens of thousands you of Americans? You keep saying Americans. he's a terrorist, but in fact it is a popular revolution, people believe, no. against you uh -huh. that was part of the Arab Spring that influenced some yeah. of the other countries. Revolution should be Syrian, cannot be a revolution imported from abroad. But revolution it didn't start from abroad, it started here. Yeah, those people that started here, they support the government now against those rebels. That's what you don't know. You don't know as an American, you don't know as a reporter. That's, what, that's why talking about what happened at the very beginning is completely different from what's happening now. It's not the same. There's very high dynamic things have ch is ch are changing on a daily basis. So it's a completely different uh, image. Those people though, who wanted revolution, they are cooperating with us. I'm asking you again, is, is it in fact you being your father's son and you believe that the only way to drive out people is to eliminate them the same way your father did? In, in being independent, yes. In fighting terrorism, yes. In defending the Syrian people and the country, yes. When I first interviewed you, mm -hmm. um, there was talk of Bashar al-Assad, he's the hope, he's the reformer. Mm -hmm. That's not what they say anymore. Who? People who write about you, people who talk about you, people mm -hmm. who uh, analyze Syria and your regime. Exactly. So the hope for American is different from the hope of Syrian. For me, I'm the hope. Of, I should be the hope of the Syrian, not any other one, not American, neither nor American, neither French or anyone in the world. I'm president to help Syrian people. So th this question should start from the hope of the Syrian people. And if there's any change regarding that hope, we should ask the Syrian people, not anyone else in the world. But now they say their words. A butcher. Comparisons to the worst dictators ever to walk on the face of the earth, mm -hmm. comparing you to them. Uh, using weapons uh, that go beyond warfare. Everything they could say bad about a dictator, they're now saying about you. Hmm. Uh, first of all, when you have a doctor who cut the leg to prevent the patient from the gangrene, if you have to. We don't call him, but you call him a doctor. And I thank him for sa saving the lives. When you have terrorism, you have war. When you have war, you always, you always have innocent lives. That could be uh, the victim of, uh, uh, of any uh, war. So uh, you cannot talk about, we, we, we don't have to discuss what, what the image in the West before discussing the image within Syria, that's the question. It's not just, the, it's just not the West, I mean it's the East and it's the Middle East and I mean, you know, the eyes of the world have been on Syria. We have seen atrocities on both sides, but on your side as well. They have seen brutality by a dictator that they say okay. so we uh, have to put you in yeah. a category with the worst. Yeah. So we have to allow uh, the terrorists to come and kill the Syrians and destroy the country much, much more. This is where you can be a good president. That's what you, imp what you imply. Yeah. But you can't allow the idea that there is opposition to your government from within Syria. That mm -hmm. is not possible for you to imagine. To, to imagine that we have opposition? Yes. We have it and you can go and meet with them. We have some of them within the government. We have some of them outside the government. They are opposition. We have it. But those are the people who've been fighting against you. Opposition is different from terrorism. Opposition is a political movement. Opposition doesn't mean to take uh, uh, armament and kill people and destroy everything. Do you call the people in Los Angeles in the 90s, do you call them rebels or opposition? What would the British call the rebels less than two years ago in London? Did they, did they call them opposition or rebels? 
Why should we call them opposition? They are rebels. They are not rebels, even they are terrorists. They are behaving is opposition, opposing country or government by behaving, by barbecuing head, by eating the hearts of your victim. Is that opposition? What do you call the people who attacked uh, the 2011th of September? Il opposition? Even if they're not American, I know this. But some of them, they have, I think, national uh, nationality. I think one of them has uh, American nationality. Do you call him opposition or terrorist? Why should you use a term in the United States and uh, England and maybe other countries and use another term in Syria? This is double standard that we don't accept. I once asked you what you feared the most, and you said the end of Syria as a secular state. Yeah. Is that end already here? Uh, according to what we've been seeing recently in the area where the terrorists control, where they ban people from going to schools, ban uh, uh, young men from shaving their beards, and women have to wear, to be covered from top to toes, from head to toes. Uh, and let's say, in brief, they leave the Taliban style in Afghanistan, completely the same style. With the time, yes, we can be worried because the secular state should reflect uh, secular society. And this secular society, with the time, if you don't get rid of those terrorists and this extremism and the Wahhabi style, of course, it will influence at least the new and the coming generations. So and we, we don't say that we don't have it. We're still secular in Syria. But with the time, this secularism will be eroding. Mr. President, thank you for allowing us to have a conversation about uh, Syria mm -hmm. uh, and in war that is within as well as um, the future of the country. Thank you. Thank you for coming to Syria.